Well, folks, earlier this week, you remember that we reported on DEI inside medical schools, diversity, equity, and inclusion over at Duke Medical School's surgical teams that are being infused with DEI principles, medical schools that are teaching wokeness as opposed to, you know, actual medicine. And we asked you for tips. And so we have received those tips. We are now breaking news about internal emails from UCLA's medical school, which is one of the best in the country. My wife went to UCLA Medical School. It's a great medical school. But if you want to understand how DEI works at medical schools, you have to see these emails. So these emails come from a mandatory class. It is called Structural Racism and Health Equity. In Structural Racism and Health Equity, UCLA medical students are told to read about wars of indigenous resistance in which Native Americans killed thousands of white people to imagine what liberation could look like. This is legitimately what is being taught at medical schools like UCLA. You have to be inculcated into the cult of wokeness in order to actually achieve that which you seek to achieve, which, of course, is the DEI principle. Meanwhile, students are also taught about blackness and indigeneity and, quote, how we can imagine a world in the aftermath of settler colonialism and white supremacy. And uh, students are also told that for further recommended reading, they should read an article titled Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, which, again, when, when people say decolonization is not a metaphor, what they mean is that they are excusing actual violence. Imagine a world in the aftermath of settler colonialism and, and white supremacy, by the way, means eviscerating all the social structures, because what the left means when they say settler colonialism is literally anything the West has done. And when they mean white supremacy, they don't mean white people believing they are superior to black people. They just mean all the structures of society, which they believe are inherently racist. The emails from this first year class over at UCLA Medical School also reveal that students are encouraged to listen to a podcast titled Indigene, which covers an array of unscientific garbage, including people who identify as, quote unquote, two spirit and women. Right? Because you can't say women because it includes men. So it's W-O-M-X-N, which is not even pronounceable. So what exactly makes this not just recommended, but mandatory classwork for med students. How exactly does this mean that these are going to be better medical professionals? The answer is it doesn't. It inculcates into them a set of values. And that set of values is then supposed to be carried forward into the practice of medicine. You're supposed to presumably value certain patients more highly than others. You're supposed to treat your patients differently based on race, because after all, you're fighting white supremacy and settler colonialism. These materials aren't just irrelevant. They are actually dangerous because, again, the only thing you should be taught in medical school is how to do the medicining. You should not be taught about why various types of intersectional populations are more valuable than others. Because it turns out that the health recommendation for diabetes should be the same across the board. It should not depend on the quote unquote history of structural racism. You shouldn't have to pull your punches because you're afraid of offending somebody when the proper medical diagnosis of an issue requires that diagnosis. The only way to actually stop all of this is, of course, to expose it. So that is what we have been doing. Again, folks, if you have any sort of information, newsworthy information you'd like to share, go to tips.dailywire.com and go check them out right now and send us whatever tips you have, and we may report it on the show. We'll get to more on that in just one moment. First, free. You know that, that word? It should mean free which is why when you switch to Pure Talk today, you will get a free Samsung 5G smartphone. There's no four-line requirement, no activation fee, just a free Samsung that is built to last with a rugged screen, quick charging battery, and top-tier data security. Qualifying plans start at just 35 bucks monthly for unlimited talk, text, 15 gigs of data, plus mobile hotspot. Pure Talk gives you phenomenal coverage on America's most dependable 5G network. It's the same coverage you know and love, but for half the price of the other guys. Pure Talk saves the average family almost $1,000 a year. Plus, with Pure Talk, you know you're spending your hard-earned money with a company that aligns with your values. Let Pure Talk's expert U.S. customer service team help you make the switch today. Head on over to puretalk.com slash Shapiro and claim eligibility for your free brand new Samsung 5G smartphone. Start saving on wireless today. Again, go to puretalk.com slash Shapiro. Switch to my cell phone company of excellent coverage. That coverage has been getting me through the day for the last couple of years. They're awesome. They don't hate you. So what do you have to lose? Go to puretalk.com slash Shapiro and switch over today. Okay, meanwhile... Yesterday, the big news of the day is that Donald Trump and Joe Biden had dueling trips down to the border. And this is about as bad press as you can have if you are Joe Biden. This is your most vulnerable issue. According to the latest polling data, 28% of Americans say immigration is now their top issue. And on that issue, Joe Biden ranks in the low 30s. He's 20 points underwater against Donald Trump on this issue, maybe 30, according to certain polls. 
And so he heads down to the border at the exact same time that Trump is on the border, which is always going to go poorly for him. This, of course, comes at the same exact time that polling is showing him trailing Donald Trump in a wide variety of battleground states. Brand new Bloomberg News Morning Consult Swing State Voter Survey published on Thursday shows Trump is ahead of Biden in Arizona, 49-43, in Georgia, 49-43, in Michigan, 46-44, in Nevada, 48-42, in North Carolina, 50-41, to in Pennsylvania, 49-43, to and in Wisconsin, 46-42. to Those are devastatingly terrible numbers. The closest state there is Michigan, which, of course, is, as we will discuss, why Joe Biden is now pandering to the Hamas fans in Dearborn. It should be pointed out, by the way, that when it comes to Michigan, the exaggerated tale of how Joe Biden, if he appeals to the Hamas next, will win Michigan is not true. When people say that 100,000 un- people voted uncommitted in the state of Michigan, that was about 13% of the number of people who voted in the Michigan Democratic primary. When Barack Obama in 2012 ran, about 10% of people in the Democratic primary voted uncommitted. And if you go and look at Dearborn, Michigan, maybe four or 5,000 people total voted uncommitted in Dearborn, Michigan, which was supposed to be the place where Joe Biden was going to just absolutely get shellacked by the Arab American population that tends to be disproportionately pro-Hamas. In reality, a lot of people are voting uncommitted against Joe Biden, not because of the Hamas war. They're voting against Joe Biden or voting uncommitted because they don't think he's a very good president. In any case, the 45th president, Donald Trump, according to the New York Post, beats out Biden in a five-way ballot test. Trump is 43, Biden 37. RFK gets 9%. Cornell West and Green Party candidate Jill Stein get 1% each. And in a head-to-head, Trump is ahead further. A large part of this is because people think that Joe Biden is not just incompetent. They think that he is senile. And that is because he is both incompetent as well as senile. According to the Washington Post, Biden and Trump headed to different parts of the border. They visited separate Texas border towns. So President Biden went to Brownsville, Texas, which is a place where the immigration problem has largely been brought under control. Meanwhile, Donald Trump went to Eagle Pass, which of course is where immigration has not been brought under control. Joe Biden didn't go to Eagle Pass because it looked really ugly for him. It would actually be quite hideous if he went to Eagle Pass. And then in the background, you just see illegal immigrants rushing across the border shouting Joe Biden's name. That would probably be a bad look for him. So he didn't go to Eagle Pass. None of them went to the border in Arizona where we went, which is where you're actually seeing most of the fentanyl trafficking happening right now. All this also comes amidst Joe Biden's White House referring to illegal immigrants as newcomers. I'm not kidding you. This is a thing that they did. There's a White House fact sheet that was put forward on the Senate bill that includes some language with regards to the border. And here's what the White House says, quote, the bill includes $1.4 billion for cities and states who are providing critical services to newcomers and would expedite work permits for people who are in the country and qualify. They keep using the word newcomers as opposed to illegal immigrants. How warm do you think Americans are toward that proposal? Seriously, that these are just newcomers as opposed to people who are illegally entering the country. How many people believe it when Alejandro Mayorkas, the Secretary of Homeland Security, says that no executive action Joe Biden can take would fix the border crisis? We know for a fact there are significant executive actions that Joe Biden took as soon as he took office to reverse what Donald Trump had done on the border itself. Here's Alejandro Mayorkas, however, protesting that actually, actually, Joe Biden can't do enough. There's nothing he can do on the border via executive action, despite the fact that Donald Trump did. Are there no executive actions that the president can take to reduce the number, the large number of migrants that uh, are coming to the U.S.-Mexico border that we saw in 2023 and continue this year? The fact of the matter is that the only enduring solution is legislation. Congress needs to act. We have a bipartisan piece of legislation that three senators worked on intensely for a number of months. I was very privileged to be at the table to provide technical and operational expertise. The administration was represented at the table. We need Congress to act. Nobody actually believes that they need Congress to act. Because Donald Trump did not need Congress to act. So what did Joe Biden actually do when he got down to the border? Well, first, he staggered around a lot. And the video of Joe Biden just looks terrible. It looks as though members of Border Patrol are escorting an Alzheimer patient on a walkabout. That's what it looks like. He can barely stagger. I mean, this just looks, I'm sorry, it looks awful. The president of the United States does, he is not physically capable of this job. 
I mean, look, look at this. This is, it, it's honestly, it's sad to watch. He's effectively dragging his feet. You're afraid he's going to slip on the gravel and, and fall over. He can hardly walk more than a few steps. This is a sort of commanding image that you want to be demonstrating at America's southern border, which is wide open to the drug cartels. And make no mistake, Joe Biden's policies have fomented the designs of the drug cartels. Again, go check out the first episode of our series, Divided States of Biden, over at Daily Wire, and you will see that Joe Biden has left that southern border wide open, and he's basically acting at the behest of the drug cartels at this point. The drug cartels are rushing illegal immigrants to certain parts of the border so as to redirect border patrol from other parts of the border. And then once those parts of the border are left unoccupied, that is when the drug cartels rush across all the guys with the backpacks filled with fentanyl. That's what's actually happening at the border. And so seeing a staggering, doddering old man barely holding himself upright around the border is not exactly a good look. Then Joe Biden tries to blame Republicans for not putting together a bipartisan consensus on immigration. There is a bipartisan consensus. Close the border. Just do it. No one's stopping you, dude. But here is Joe Biden trying to blame Donald Trump. It is not going to work. I understand my predecessor's legal eagle pass today. So here's what I would say to Mr. Trump. Instead of playing politics with the issue, instead of telling members of Congress to block this legislation, join me or I'll join you in telling the Congress to pass this bipartisan border security bill. We can do it together. You know and I know. It's the toughest, most efficient, most effective border security bill this country has ever seen. So instead of playing politics with the issue, why don't we just get together and get it done? Okay, except for the fact that you could do it yourself. Your own administration has floated trial balloons about returning to remain in Mexico via executive action. This is a winning issue for Donald Trump, which is why Joe Biden went down to the border and actively humiliated himself further. I truly think, you know, people ask, who exactly is running the, the Biden White House? Who's running the Biden campaign? Given the absolute incompetence of this campaign, the answer is Joe Biden. This is a massive PR boo-boo for Joe Biden. So just a couple of weeks ago, he committed another massive PR boo-boo. He had the, the prosecutor, the special prosecutor who was looking into his mishandling of classified information basically say that he's a senile dotard. And he immediately rushed to the microphones to prove it. And he held a, a late night press conference. By late night, I mean, it was like 7.30 at night. But for him, that's late night because that's well after the Denny's early bird special is available. And he's normally tucked into bed by that point. He does a press conference trying to demonstrate his mental acuity. And in the process, proceeds to call the president of Egypt, the president of Mexico, and forget where exactly his son got his rosary. The only person who made that call was Joe Biden. So who made the call to send Joe Biden down to the border to dotter around and totter around? on a gravel road, and then blame Donald Trump. It's, it's only got to be Biden. It's got to be Biden himself. Because if you, like, you know it would make sense. If you were going to go down to the border and announce strong action on the border, then it makes sense to go to the border. If you're going to go there and just look at things, it makes no sense at all. You look not only like a do-nothing, it looks like you're ignoring the waves of illegal immigration that have crippled the country for the last several years. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, without partners like Stamps.com, we would not be one of America's fastest growing media outlets. Seriously, if we had to waste hours at the post office all day, every day, we wouldn't have been able to grow into the company we are today. Stamps.com lets you print your own postage and shipping labels from your home or office. It's very convenient. You can prepare your shipping labels in minutes, get back to running your business sooner. Even better, you can take care of orders from anywhere with their mobile app. Scheduling package pickups is easy through the Stamps.com dashboard. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable to over 1 million businesses. You can print postage wherever you do business. There are no lines, traffic, or waiting. They even send you a free scale, so you'll have everything you need to get started. Grow your business with America's trusted postage partner, Stamps.com. Sign up today at Stamps.com slash Shapiro for a special offer, including a four-week trial, free postage, free digital scale, no long-term commitments, no contracts. Just go to Stamps.com slash Shapiro. That is Stamps.com slash Shapiro. Go check them out right now for that special offer. That's the four-week trial, free postage, free digital scale, no long-term commitments or contracts. Stamps.com slash Shapiro. Meanwhile, again, Donald Trump himself went down to the border as well. And I'll leave it to you to decide who is closer to the median American on this particular issue, Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Here is Donald Trump talking about this being a Joe Biden invasion. He is correct. This is a Joe Biden invasion. This is a Biden invasion over the past three years. I call him Crooked Joe because he's crooked. He's a terrible president, the worst president our country's ever had, uh, probably the most incompetent president we've ever had. But it's uh, allowing thousands and thousands of people to come in from China, Iran, Yemen, the Congo, Syria, 
and a lot of other nations, many nations are not very friendly to us. He's transported the entire columns of uh, fighting aged men, and they're all at a certain age, and you look at them and they say, they're they look like warriors to me. Something's going on that's bad. Now the United States is being overrun by the Biden migrant crime. It's a new form of uh, vicious violation to our country. It's migrant crime. We call it Biden migrant crime, but that's a little bit long. So we'll just leave it. But every time you hear the term migrant crime, you know where that comes from, allowing Thousands and thousands and actually millions and millions of people to come. Could be 15 million, could be 18 million by the time he uh, gets out of office. Okay, well, it may not be 15 or 18, but it's certainly 7 to 10. And then Trump put forward a pretty obvious proposition, which is we've seen a wide variety of crimes committed by illegal immigrants over the course of the last week alone. We've reported them here on the show. And, and here is Donald Trump pointing out Joe Biden does, in fact, have blood on his hands. And there's no other way to put that. When you decide to leave the border wide open, when you decide that you're going to change asylum policy so that in order for you to be released in the country, all you have to do is say, I fear to go home. You're going to end up with an awful lot of people who commit crimes in the country. And again, there, there are a lot of arguments as to whether illegal immigration increases the crime rate or whether illegal immigrants have a lower crime rate than certain subsections of the American population. That's irrelevant. Zero crime should be committed by people who are here illegally because they shouldn't be here in the first place. Here is Donald Trump going off on Biden. Last year, a sadistic illegal alien criminal who was released into our country by Joe Biden was arrested for raping an 11 year old girl and strangling her to death in Pasadena, Texas. And shortly before she was murdered, she texted her father that someone was knocking at the door. He arrived home from work and found his daughter's body stuffed in a laundry basket underneath the bed. Horrible. Crooked Joe is the blood of countless innocent victims. It's so many stories to tell, so many horrible stories. Three years ago, we had the most secure border in history. Brandon was saying it. The general was saying it. We had the most secure border. And people weren't coming because they knew they weren't going to get in. He is right. He is right. So this is a major fail by Joe Biden. He looks feeble. He looks out of touch. He looks like he's not taking the action that he should. All of this is a problem for him. Now, the media are simultaneously trying to put to bed the border issue by blaming it on both sides and then trying to put to bed the Hunter Biden corruption issue. That issue is not going to go away. So the media have been trying to play up the fact that the FBI is prosecuting an unnamed source who was quoted by the FBI at one point with regard to the idea that Joe Biden was paid directly $5 million and so was Hunter Biden. Okay, that was a very small part of the Hunter Biden case and it was late breaking. We've been reporting on the Hunter Biden corruption allegations for legitimately several years. By the time that report from the FBI was even pushed out into the public by the House Oversight Committee. With that said, Hunter Biden testified behind closed doors the other day. And the media basically declared that the Hunter Biden corruption story is now over because Hunter Biden had testified that his father had nothing to do with it. And really, it, it, he was just it was all because he was high or drunk. None of this passes the smell test. So, for example, according to The New York Post, First son Hunter Biden claims in congressional testimony on Wednesday that he was high or drunk when he wrote to a Chinese associate in 2017 that he was, quote, sitting here with my father shortly before the transfer of $5.1 million into Biden family linked accounts. A readout of the 54 year old first son's closed door impeachment inquiry deposition was provided to numerous news outlets on Wednesday evening, citing Hunter's claim that Biden had nothing to do with the shakedown of the Chinese state link CEFC China Energy. You recall this story this is a story in which Hunter Biden was on WhatsApp with a person named Zhao, and demanded a bunch of money and said, I'm sitting right here next to my father. And if you don't give us what we want, my father is going to basically put the screws to you publicly. According to the readout, it said that Hunter admitted he was high or drunk when he sent the sitting here with my father WhatsApp message. That he, and he says he sent it to the wrong recipient and is now embarrassed by the message. The same source said that Hunter confirmed his dad was not sitting next to him. Well, there's only one problem. Why exactly would you believe Hunter Biden? So basically... The case Hunter Biden is now making is that you have contemporaneous WhatsApp messages showing I was at my dad's house at the time and my dad was home. And then imagine he says that he sent the text, the WhatsApp to the wrong Zhao that didn't actually go to the guy who ran CEFC was some random guy named Zhao. Weird then that the next day, five million bucks showed up from Zhao in his account. What a coinky dink. Or alternatively, this sounds like a giant lie. Since Hunter appeared under a subpoena, the, te the testimony technically counted as a more sensitive definition rather than a typical transcribed interview. 
That WhatsApp missive implicating Joe Biden was provided to Congress last year by the IRS case agent Joseph Ziegler. Again, the most damning stuff with regard to Hunter Biden is all stuff that Hunter Biden himself said. Forget about what people said about Hunter Biden, the Tony Bobolinskis of the world. The most damaging stuff that is said in the Hunter Biden case was all said by Hunter Biden. The WhatsApp message saying my daddy is sitting right here with me. Give me what I want. The text to his own daughter saying I've been paying this family's bills for half, uh, like half the family's bills for all of my life. Dad just takes my money. Like all that stuff is incredibly damaging and it's directly from him. Again, the, the fact that, that the media are trying to suggest that basically the case is now over. Yeah, no, it's not. And even if it doesn't end in Joe Biden's impeachment, the widespread perception of the Biden family, which is correct, is that it is deeply corrupt because obviously it is. Every single person with the last name Biden has been making money off Joe being in politics for legitimately decades at this point. Since the 1970s, for half a century, they've been making money off Joe in politics. And everyone knows it. We'll get to more on this in just a moment. First, I've been talking about my Helix mattress for literally years. I've had it for as long as my children have been alive, actually. And it may be the thing that's keeping me alive because my kids wake me up at all times. But when I get back on that mattress, I can go back to sleep. Why? Because the mattress is made just for me. If you haven't already checked out the Helix Elite Collection, you should. Helix harnesses years of extensive mattress expertise to offer a truly elevated sleep experience. The Helix Elite Collection includes six different mattress models, each tailored for specific sleep positions and firmness preferences. If you're nervous about buying a mattress online, you really don't have to be. Helix has a sleep quiz that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress. Why would you buy a mattress made for somebody else? I took the Helix quiz. I was matched with a firm but breathable mattress. Plus, Helix has a 10-year warranty. You can try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you're going to love it. Their financing options and flexible payment plans make it so a great night's sleep is never far away. Helix is offering 25% off all mattress orders, plus two free pillows for my listeners. Head on over to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Use code HELIXPARTNER25. It's their best offer yet. It's not going to last long. With Helix, better sleep starts right now. Okay, meanwhile, I am pleased that the Republicans decided that they would not, in fact, jump on a rake. So the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, he did sign off on a temporary spending bill to prevent a partial government shutdown this weekend. Now, a bunch of people on the right are very upset with Mike Johnson because they believe that every time there is a spending bill that the power of the purse lies with the House, the House has an obligation not to abuse the power of the purse, and that basically that means that any time the Republican House has the chance, they should use the leverage in order to lower the spending. The point that I'm making is that on principle, I agree with that. And when it comes to the pure politics of the situation, that's a very bad idea. Those two things can simultaneously coexist. In the best of all possible worlds, we would run every appropriations bill through the appropriations process. In the best of all possible worlds, Republican houses would initiate only the kinds of spending that are constitutional, which would cut government spending by approximately 98%. With all of that said, if the Republicans were to jump on the giant rake right in front of them and shut down the government right now, as Joe Biden is proceeding along the course of election loss, that would be political malpractice. The reality is you can only achieve large scale change in American government when you have unified control of the government. The days of bipartisan cooperation on things like budget balancing are well over. That is not going to happen anymore. The Clintonian era in which Democrats and Republicans after the 96 election came together to do welfare reform, that is a thing that is not going to happen again. Which means that Republicans are going to have to trade some short term laws for some long term gain if they hope to win back political power. Mike Johnson knows that this is the first sign that Mike Johnson actually I think, is, is using his political common sense here rather than being held captive by the Republican caucus. So here's Mike Johnson yesterday announcing that they were not going to shut down the government. How do you respond to criticisms from some of your members saying that they have been left in the dark and haven't been seeing a transparent process when it comes to government funding? Yeah, so look, the appropriation, appropriations process is, is ugly. Democracy is ugly. Um, this is the way it works every year, always has, except that we've instituted some new innovations. We broke the omnibus fever, right? That's how Washington has been run for years. We're, we're, we're trying to turn the aircraft carrier back to real budgeting and spending reform. This was an important thing to break it up into smaller pieces. Okay, now the problem for Mike Johnson that is going to crop up going forward is that the process that he used here, he could theoretically also use with regard to any sort of aid package for Ukraine or Israel. And that's what the Biden administration immediately is jumping on. So the the approval in the House for some sort of big aid package on the foreign front is very large. You would get at least 300, probably 350 votes in the House 
for some sort of aid package at this point. And Johnson has been holding it back, presumably because he's afraid that he's going to lose his speakership position. Yesterday, however, he did bring forward a proposal that 99 Republicans voted against. Most Republicans did back the speaker, but that was also true of Kevin McCarthy. When Kevin McCarthy was passing bills, he was doing it with the majority of, of the Republicans, but he was doing it with some Democrats as well. And that apparently was enough of a sin for Matt Gates and others to try to oust him. So the question is, where is that wing of the party now? Representative Andy Biggs, who's one of these people, voted against the deadline extensions and said that Johnson hasn't worked hard enough to cut spending and that he squandered House Republicans' sole source of leverage by un being unwilling to shut down the government. But in reality, again, at some point, the Speaker of the House is going to have to actually govern or he's not going to be the Speaker very long. He's going to be the minority leader very soon. And meanwhile, Joe Biden, again, is operating under the bizarre proposition that if he caves to Hamas, somehow this will be better for his presidency. It's, it's a very weird proposition. You know what Americans don't like very much? When American allies lose. They do not like when America basically fosters terrorist victory. You know how we know that? Because they did in Afghanistan. Joe Biden did that in Afghanistan and his approval rating absolutely tanked and has never recovered. The media may be disquieted by the ugliness of war, but you know what the American people really, really don't like? When America's enemies, people who hate America, win. Americans really don't like that very much. We don't like the, the war in our faces all the time, but there's something we like even less, and that is losing wars. I understand that this has become the way that the media have basically controlled American foreign policy for, de for decades at this point. Right? Pretty much every American foreign policy has been an initiation of force or support of force by an ally. And then the media immediately attempt to, to do the, well, war is very ugly, it's very ugly. Well, here's the problem. America's enemies know that war is ugly and they know that Americans care that war is ugly. And so they attempt to leverage that. That's, presum that's exactly what Hamas is doing right now. According to the Wall Street Journal, senior members of Hamas's leadership in exile met in Doha, Qatar earlier this month amid concerns as fighters were getting mauled by the Israeli offensive in the Gaza Strip. Enemy troops were killing dozens of militants each day as they methodically overran Hamas strongholds. Then a courier arrived with a message from Yahya Sinwar, the head of Hamas in Gaza, saying, in effect, don't worry, we have the Israelis right where we want them. Hamas's fighters, the al Qassam brigades, were doing fine, the upbeat message said. The militants were ready for Israel's expected assault on Rafah, a city on Gaza's southern edge. High civilian casualties would add to the worldwide pressure on Israel to stop the war, Sinwar's message said, according to people informed about the meeting. Again, this is, this is how Hamas wins. The way Hamas wins is not by winning. At least 12,000 members of Hamas, direct militant members of Hamas, have been killed, along with a bunch of fellow travelers. Remember, when you read statistics about women and children who are killed in Gaza, many of the people who are considered children under a normal definition of child, meaning under 18 years old, many of those are 16-year-old boys who are fellow travelers with Hamas, for example. We don't actually have straight statistics from inside the Gaza Strip because Hamas is providing them and Hamas lies all the time. If you really believe that Hamas is going around counting bodies and identifying who has died, they're making it up on the spot. Legitimately making it up. We know this for a fact. Which is why it is so pathetic that, for example, the Biden administration continues to mimic the propaganda put out by Hamas. That's what Hamas wants. Hamas has only one plan to survive this. Get enough Palestinian civilians killed that they can then get the international community to pressure Israel into preserving Hamas. That is all they want out of life right now. And bizarrely, that's exactly what members of the Biden administration and the Europeans are doing. They are now suggesting that Israel basically ought to leave Hamas in place because if they don't leave Hamas in place, then too many people will die because of Hamas. Okay, that is a formula for never winning a war again for anyone who's in the West. I mean, you've basically just given them the upper hand, the more evil and brutal they are toward their own civilians, the more you're going to leave them alone, seems to be the prevailing message here. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, let's say that you used to have an employee named Jess. She decided to leave the company to go to live in a terrible place like New York City because she likes eating out of dumpsters or something. And technically, I can't fire her because she left, but due to her bad choices, she is fired nonetheless and we must replace her. Well, now would be the time to check out Zip Recruiter. Right now, you can try Zip Recruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter's brilliant technology will lead you to top talent. Immediately after you post your job, ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology shows you qualified candidates. Once you review your list of qualified candidates, you can easily invite your top choices to apply, so they will likely apply sooner, and you will fill that role faster. Go check out ZipRecruiter right now, because if you have great employees and they leave you to go to New York City for no reason you can discern, then you really need better employees. Head on over to ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire right now. Four to five employers who post on ZipRecruiter will get a quality candidate within day one. Once again, just head on over to ZipRecruiter right now for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash Daily Wire. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. Meanwhile, by the way, Israel is supposed to ignore the fact 
that its own citizens are still being killed. So in other words, when Hamas and its allies and the Palestinian Authority murder Israelis, the world does not care one iota, like at all. So yesterday, in a story that no one covered, two Israeli citizens were murdered at a gas station in Ailey, which is in the West Bank. A Palestinian terrorist opened fire at the gas station. This would be the second time in a year that this gas station has been targeted by terrorists. And as it turns out, one of the one of the people who committed the attack is a member of the Palestinian Authority police. Now, the Palestinian Authority, those are the people that the Biden administration would like to run the Gaza Strip, the Palestinian Authority. So the Biden administration's plan in the Middle East is to hand over power to the Palestinian Authority, which literally pays people who murder Jews, pays their families, and preserve Hamas, presumably in order so that Joe Biden can win Michigan or something. And, and again, let's be very clear about this. There is no party on the other side of the aisle from Israel that is willing to make anything like a lasting peace. It does not exist. For example, here is a senior Palestinian official just this week talking about how Hitler was right. This is very typical rhetoric in the Palestinian Authority. He says several European, American and Arab officials have said that an Israeli attack against the Palestinians in Rafah would constitute a no lesser crime than the Holocaust. I would like to ask, why did the Holocaust happen? I am not a fan of Hitler, but, but when Hitler perpetrated the Holocaust, he had obvious reasons. The Jews and global Zionism were offered various places in the world. In Argentina, in Uganda, in the north of Sinai, in the south of Iraq. But they chose Palestine for other reasons that we may mention later. They plan to take control of Germany, is the Palestinian Authority, guys. The Jews plan to take control of Germany, so Hitler had to kill them, obviously. These are the people that, that Joe Biden would like to leave in place and give power. So all of this has been exacerbated by an incident that happened inside the Gaza Strip. And there are two accounts of this incident. One is the account that is being perpetrated by Hamas and Al Jazeera, which is run by Qatar, which, of course, works very closely with the leadership of Hamas and, and supports Hamas. And the other is the IDF. One account is backed by zero footage, but a lot of anecdotal accounts. And one is backed by actual drone footage. So the account that is being pushed out there by the Palestinian Authority, by Hamas, by the Europeans, is an account in which Israeli forces open fire on a bunch of people who are trying to get aid, humanitarian aid that the Israelis themselves are carrying in there. Israel has created a humanitarian corridor so aid can get in. Hamas, by the way, has been hijacking all of this aid and stealing all of it and then killing people who are attempting to stop them in that effort, which has created a massive poverty and hunger situation in the Gaza Strip, despite the fact that Israel is placing literally no limits on food aid going in. There's no one to distribute it is the problem because Hamas kills people and then takes the food. Not only that, the Israelis have been putting their own troops in harm's way in order to try to provide humanitarian aid. Oh, by the way, all of this ends literally today if Hamas surrenders and gives up the 134 hostages it is currently holding. Everyone just pretends that that never happened or that Hamas doesn't exist anymore or something. So the White House is still saying they don't know what happened and no one knows what except for the drone footage. And they called it tremendously alarming. So what happened? Israel shared drone footage of troops' attempts to disperse a swelling mob, denying responsibility for the mass deaths amid international criticism of its Gaza offensive. Hamas has blamed the IDF for reported 104 deaths in the early morning hours. Now, we still don't know how many people have actually died at this point because Hamas lies about its stats. The military said that fewer than 10 of the casualties were a result of Israeli fire, and they released new details Thursday night, claiming soldiers had fired warning shots and attempted to ease the crush of people, looting a convoy of aid trucks that entered northern Gaza early on Thursday morning. The violence was quickly condemned by Arab countries and Joe Biden held talks on the incident with the leaders of Egypt and Qatar. And then both the White House and State Department expressed horror over what occurred and indicated they would demand answers from Israel. Now, again, nobody ever demands answers from Hamas on like why they are looting aid trucks. And nobody ever demands apparently that Hamas just surrender. They're currently holding negotiations with Hamas. So that forced the IDF to publish a drone video showing thousands of people swarming around the aid trucks as they reached the area in northern Gaza. The vehicles tried to pushed forward very slowly. 
And then apparently what happened is as they tried to back away, many Gazans decided that they were going to rush the soldiers and a tank at an IDF checkpoint. That was after they'd already rushed the last truck in the convoy further south. That's when some Israeli soldiers opened fire on people who were literally rushing a border checkpoint and a tank. They didn't open fire on the crowd. You can see from the drone footage, they're not opening fire on the crowd. Look at the size of this crowd. Okay, here are the aid trucks. For those who can't see, it looks like World War Z. I mean, this is just thousands of people who are crowding these aid trucks, trying to get food. Presumably, the Israelis at this point, if they'd wanted to massacre people, seriously could have. There is no fire. You can see, I mean, every aid truck is being crowded by thousands of people, thousands. And then... Israel is trying to slowly back away. They have tanks. Okay, they have, again, overwhelming firepower. Most of the people who were injured and killed were killed in this crush because there's a mob rush on the aid trucks. And then apparently, they fired some warning shots to try to disperse the crowd some so that the aid trucks could move. And then some people rushed the Israeli soldiers, some of the Israeli soldiers further up, and some people were killed. This, of course, ended with a bunch of, of people in the UN and the European Union claiming that this is all Israel's fault, which is amazing because it turns out that it's all Hamas's fault. Again, Hamas started a war. When you rush across another nation's borders and kill 1,200 of its citizens and take 240 hostage, that tends to lead to war. According to the IDF spokesperson, he said this morning, the IDF coordinated a convoy of 38 trucks to provide additional humanitarian assistance to the residents of northern Gaza. This humanitarian aid came from Egypt, went through a security screening at the Karim Shalom humanitarian crossing in Israel, and then entered Gaza for distribution by private contractors. As these vital humanitarian supplies made their way toward Gazans in need, thousands of Gazans rushed the trucks. Some began violently pushing and trampling other Gazans to death, looting the humanitarian supplies. Here are the facts. At 4.40 a.m., the first aid truck in the humanitarian convoy started making its way through the humanitarian corridor that we were securing. Our tanks were there to secure the humanitarian corridor for the aid convoy. Our UAVs were there in the air to give our forces a clear picture from above. At 4.45 a.m., a mob ambushed the aid trucks, bringing the convoy to a halt. In this video, the tanks that were there to secure the convoy saw the Gazans being trampled and cautiously tried to disperse the mob with a few warning shots. When the hundreds became thousands and things got out of hand, the tank commander decided to retreat to avoid harm to the thousands of Gazans that were there. You can see how cautious they were when they were backing up. There's video to back all of this. There's drone footage of all of this. They were backing up securely, risking their own lives, not shooting at the mob. No IDF strike was conducted toward the aid convoy. On the contrary, the IDF was there carrying out a humanitarian aid operation to secure the humanitarian corridor to allow the aid convoy to reach its distribution point so the humanitarian aid could reach Gazan civilians in the north who are in need. Then, of course, Saudi, Egypt, Jordan, they all accuse Israel of targeting civilians in the incident, of course. And so did Turkey, which, of course, backs Hamas. And France, which can always be counted on to take the, uh, the anti-Semitic position, they said the fire by Israeli soldiers against civilians trying to access food is unjustifiable. Spain, also the most anti-Semitic country in Europe, they said something similar. You had, of course, Gustavo Petro, who was the left-wing president of Colombia, announcing that his government was suspending purchases of weapons from Israel. So again, this is a blood libel. The evidence suggests that Israel did not, in fact, open fire into a crowd of civilians. If they had, it would all be on that UAV footage, which it is not. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. And this is why, again, members of the media are looking for moral equivalence beyond anything else, like really looking for it. So CNN properly reported, for example, that this was a chaotic incident, which it was, okay, because nobody actually knows what happened yet. Even CNN's headline here is misleading. They say at least 100 killed and 700 injured in chaotic incident where IDF opened fire as people waited for food in Gaza, Palestinian officials say. So again, that, that even that headline is misleading, but that wasn't good enough for John Stewart, who's constantly in search of moral equivalence. He said, Note to CNN, a chaotic incident is college kids storming a basketball court, not a massacre at a food line. Again, massacre at a food line assumes facts, not in evidence, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. And then Joe Biden, of course, comes forward and says, this incident is going to complicate the negotiations. You know what's complicated the negotiations? What's constant? Hamas has rejected every ceasefire deal presented to it because they insist that Israel leave them alone and leave them in power. This doddering old fool when he's not eating ice cream and talking about ceasefires that are unachievable is not eating ice cream and talking about ceasefires that are unachievable. The deadly Gaza incident complicates hostage negotiations. That incident happens because Hamas is starving the people of Gaza. They started a war. They don't care whether those people live or die. In fact, that's wrong. They want them to die. But here is Joe Biden doing the dirty work. Are you worried about complications negotiations? I know. I know. I know. It's going gonna, it's gonna to complicate the negotiations. And lending moral credibility to Hamas, to terrorists, this is not a good look. 
You want to lose an election, this is a really good way to do it. He thinks he's going to win 5,000 votes in Dearborn. He's going to lose hundreds of thousands of votes across the country based on his absolute cowardice on issues like this one. Okay. By the way, he's still claiming that he's hopeful about the ceasefire, which is, again, first rule of negotiations. Don't go out and publicly talk about the negotiations, you doofus. Here he was. Probably not by Monday, but he's hopeful. Based on what? Based on what? The reality is that because he's talking about the negotiations publicly, he is giving every piece of leverage to Hamas. He's saying, I want this, I want the ceasefire so bad I can taste it. And Hamas is like, well, what are you going to give us for it? What do we get for it? Now, the reality is what's actually happening for Hamas and Hezbollah, which are both run by Iran, both Hamas and Hezbollah are hoping that Israel does not go into Rafah. If Israel goes into Rafah, it's going to finish off Hamas. Yahya Sinwar will likely be captured or killed. When that happens, Israel presumably will turn north. Hezbollah is threatening that if Israel goes into Rafah, that Hezbollah is going to open a northern front. Joe Biden wants to prevent all of that, not because it would drag America into war. It wouldn't. Israel would just go hog wild on Hezbollah in the north is what would happen. Biden wants to prevent that because, again, he's afraid he's going to lose Michigan. That's all this is about. If Joe Biden were secure in his knowledge that that the Arab Americans in Michigan were going to vote for him, he would not care. Okay, that is the reality. Because, again, it is actually in America's interest for terrorist groups to get their guts stomped out. Terrorist groups are a threat to America and its allies. It would be very much in America's interest to watch Israel just walk right over Hezbollah. Again, no American troops involved. No serious American cash committed. Instead, Joe Biden is trying to, to have it both ways. He knows inherently that if Hamas remains in place, it's going to be bad for him politically. But again, he's still trying to pretend that there's a moral equivalent so as to achieve an off-ramp that will amount to many, many more people killed over the, over the coming years. It, absolutely. And he's got his members of administration doing this too. Lloyd Austin, the, the garbage secretary of defense, he's still citing Hamas casualty figures. Mr. Secretary, about how many Palestinian women and children have been killed by Israel since October 7th? It's over 25,000. Okay, those are Hamas casualty figures. By the way, the, the numbers that he is using right there, even Hamas doesn't claim that. At least 12,000 military age males have been killed. It's cowardice does not win you elections and it does not win you wars. What it does win you is, is a seat in the old age home thinking about why you're no longer president after one term. That's what it actually wins you. In just one second, we'll get to the Biden administration softly backing away from its own environmentalist ideas. First, Lady Ballers is the hilarious story of how a group of male losers who can't win against other men decided to identify as women and join a women's basketball league. Absurd, ridiculous, yes? Except that it's actually happening right now. Well, here is a quick look at what is being called the most triggering movie of the decade. Leftists are losing it over Lady Ballers. Nothing's changed. This movie is a straight-up and intentional transphobic hate crime. What? I see you. The Lady Ballers movie needs to be banned. I'll cancel you. I can get the blinds, please. Code 11. The most toxic BS you've ever seen. You're a monster. Yeah. Next level hate speech propaganda. That's it? That's the pitch? Watch the most triggering comedy of the decade. <laughs> Lady Ballers. Streaming exclusively on Daily Wire Plus. Don't wait. Watch Lady Ballers, the movie Hollywood didn't make, so we did. Exclusively at Daily Wire Plus right now. And meanwhile, the Biden administration, they know how vulnerable they are. And that is why they are having the EPA actually delay a key climate rule. And then they're making up a reason why they're doing that. According to the Washington Post, the Environmental Protection Agency plans to delay final limits on planet warming emissions from gas power gas-fired power plants to significantly strengthen them, the agency announced on Thursday. The decision means the rule won't be finalized until after November. So why exactly did that get delayed, right? This is a big priority for the environmentalist, very green Biden administration is to get the EPA to basically shut down gas-fired power plants. Now, the reason they're not doing it is pretty obvious. If the energy prices go up, Joe Biden could lose the election. So instead, the EPA is going to make up another excuse. The move comes in response to pleas from environmental justice groups, which said the rule was not protective enough of disadvantaged communities that have breathed unhealthy air for decades. Communities of color in low-income neighborhoods are disproportionately located near gas plant smokestacks and other sources of industrial pollution. It also comes as Biden tries to sell voters on his climate record during a bruising re-election campaign against Donald Trump. So in May 2023, 
The EPA issued a proposed rule that called for drastically curbing greenhouse gas emissions from existing coal plants, existing gas plants, and new gas plants. The agency said Thursday that they are still on track to finalize the rule for existing coal plants and new gas plants in April. But it said the rule for existing gas plants would take longer. So why? They're, they're pretending that's because they're environmentalists. But you may notice something. The reason that they are putting a bunch of pressure on existing coal plants is because most energy is not coming from existing coal plants. And the reason they can put pressure on new gas plants is because that's not going to manifest until after the election anyway. So what is the one area of the law where the EPA is avoiding issuing a ruling? On the stuff where you mostly get your energy, which is the existing gas plants. And then the pretending is for environmentalist reasons. That is a lie. They know that their environmentalist nonsense is really, really unpopular with Americans. Americans like to pay verbal homage to the idea that they care deeply about the climate. But when it comes time to actually pay up in any serious way, Americans are not into it, especially because they know that whatever marginal sacrifice they make is going to be offset by whatever increased emissions China and India then provide to the world. And it turns out that the climate is global. And that no matter how much you cut your emissions, if China and India are making up more than that amount, all you're doing is destroying your own economy so China and economy can grow theirs. So Joe Biden knows that and his people are smart enough to tell him, dude, you really, really cannot have a massive inflationary spiral on energy prices going into an election cycle. And meanwhile, Vladimir Putin sensing mush in the Biden administration. He's now raised the specter of nuclear conflict if Ukraine's allies step further into the war. So Putin keeps saying this over and over and over. This is not the first time that he has threatened nuclear war. The talk of nuclear escalation in Putin's annual parliamentary speech on Thursday reinforces the Russian president's framing of the war in Ukraine as an existential conflict with the West. Now, there's been some talk about Vladimir Putin taking a look at Moldova. The, the, there, there are a bunch of nations that, that surround Russia that have heavy Russian populations. There's a breakaway region in Moldova that has now appealed to Vladimir Putin for protection, which is the way very often that territorially aggressive dictators then pave the way for invasion of surrounding states. Vladimir Putin is not Hitler for a variety of reasons, but territorially aggressive dictators, the way you typically do this is you find a region of a foreign country that has a lot of speakers of your language, and then you have them appeal to you for protection, and then you walk across the border to protect them. According to CNN, pro-Russian rebels in a separatist sliver of Moldova have now asked Putin to protect their region from what they claim are threats from Moldova's government. Transnistria, which illegally sp split from Moldova as the Soviet Union crumbled, has remained within the Kremlin's orbit, while Moldova is bidding to join the EU. Again, they're looking for protection because, again, if you are bordering Russia, You'd like some NATO and EU protection for sure. Politicians in Transnistria asked Moscow to guard it from increasing pressure from Moldova. The Kremlin said protecting its compatriots were a priority. So again, if you're looking at the region of Transnistria, Transnistria is bordering, you. Moldova borders Ukraine. It's between Romania and Ukraine. Transnistria is an unrecognized breakaway region, kind of along the borders of Moldova and Ukraine. It would be strategically useful for the Russians to hold it for sure. If they were able to somehow jut around from Crimea up into that region, then they would have a fairly significant chunk of Ukraine surrounded on three sides. Crimea in the south, the Donbass region in the east, and the Transnistria region in the west. With that said, do the Russians want to go to war? Moldova is you know, a, a lot closer to the rest of Europe than the eastern regions of Ukraine. According to CNN, no country officially recognizes Transnistria. Russia has about 1,500 troops there right now. Again, are, are they willing to up the ante right now? Well, Russia's war in Ukraine has had a profound effect on Transnistria's economy. Ukraine closed its border with Transnistria when the war began. Because again, they're afraid that it's a, a Russian-run region. The war is spurring Moldova to try to resolve the decades-long conflict with Transnistria. The EU has granted Moldova candidate status in June 2022. In December 2023, they started negotiating to formally bring Moldova into the EU. So, again, this could be another point of conflict. And that combined with the fact that Vladimir Putin, again, threatening nuclear weapons, suggests that there had better be some off-ramp here soon. Putin is pushing where there's mush, and he's seeing an awful lot of mush. All righty, folks, coming up, we are going to jump into the story of P. Diddy Combs. Oh, no, one of my fellow rap artists. He's being accused of sexual harassment and assault. I produced her on his latest album. Wait, you mean that, that rap culture is filled with people who do bad? No, no, it can't be true. What? If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us.